Hello and welcome to another edition of Extra Connections here on JLJ Media. I am James Lodge Jr., the JLJ of JLJ Media. That's what it stands for. And I have a great guest. You know, once in a while in my life, I get to do this where it's almost like full circle moments for me, where I actually, people that I watched or listened to or read growing up, I get to actually talk to them later. It's happened to me many times and it's happening again. A show that I love that led me to another show when calls the heart later. Cause they're like, you like Little House on the Prairie. You like the Waltz. He's like, oh, you said, I'm like, yes. But I love me some Little House on the Prairie. That was one of my shows. I actually interviewed Todd Bridges who had guested on there on an episode. We talked about his experience on there. Um, and so it was happening. But this guy also, not just on uh, the, you know, Little House on the Prairie, Here's one of my other favorite shows of all time, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He played Buffy's dad on some episodes. And I was like, that was my show. I was all, I was all about Buffy. Very excited. But he did a lot of stuff. Also, he comes from the Bay Area, which I do too. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, and so I'm very happy to have him on the show. And he also has an event coming up called the Prairie Patchwork, which I want to talk about that too, because um, uh, my other show, when it calls hard, does stuff like that too. These little reunions, we get some of the stars, and it, I'm looking at it. It looks good too. There's all kinds of stuff going on this, going on for this weekend. Uh, these weekends are coming up. But anyway, let me introduce to you Dean Butler. Hello, Dean. Hi, James. How are you? I'm fine. Okay, so I'm first of all, welcome to the show. Again, it's like a full circle moment for me because I get to actually talk to somebody that I watched on my TV set back when there were three stations. Um, I, get watch, I get to watch it. Well, there was some cable later, but in the beginning, you know, there was only three stations. Dean. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. I know. This was, uh, we came, we were involved, or I was fortunate enough to step into this little house world at a time when, when you were on, on a Monday night at eight o'clock, there was an audience of 20 million people there watching you. Yeah. You know, and, and those days are long gone, you know, Unless you're the Super Bowl, or I mean, I don't know what the events would be. Super Bowl yeah. is probably the biggest audience yeah. event of yeah. the year by far. Sunday Night Football draws the a huge audience. The Oscars, maybe, the, maybe, maybe. Which one? The yeah. no, I think the Oscars. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I wish the Oscars did draw a larger audience, but I think the Oscars, you know, in our in our culturally polarized world, the Oscars is viewed. Um, you know, there's a dividing line between the coasts and the central part of the country, and people have a very different feeling about Hollywood. So I, I uh, in different parts of the country. So I don't know that the Oscars draws the kinds of audiences that you'd like to see it have. Um, That's true. And of course, this last year was tough because no one was in theaters seeing anything. So, you know, we we're all watching it on uh, Hulu or on Amazon Prime or on Apple TV or, you know, whatever. So it, you know, what was nice about the time that we were in, James, is that it was really when people talked about water cooler conversation regarding the television that you were watching, you really could have that conversation because, look, clearly, I say an audience of 20 million. Well, that's just a fraction, a small fraction of the of the people who are watching television out there in the country. But nonetheless, it's a significant number of people. And so you have that opportunity to have this shared experience where you are in your office or you're at home or you're in a store or you're out doing something in a community. And there's a chance that you are around people that were doing the same thing you were doing last night, which was watching a particular television program. And there's something really nice about that. And we don't have that now in our culture. You know, we don't have, I mean, the fact that we're here doing this, you may get an audience, as you told me, you may get an audience for this particular event of 300 to 3,000, maybe more overall, the views may get larger over time. And that's the cool thing about this is once it's there, it's there and people can find it and watch it. That's really fun. But you don't get that explosive, huge audience premiere because you don't have the muscle to promote it. Uh, unlike the networks who could put things in newspapers on oh, their own right. air, they could, you know, they could put on the radio, yeah. they could tell you that this particular show is going to be on at eight o'clock on Monday night, and you should be there because it's going to be really cool. And that is a very powerful place to be. And there's just, as, as I started off saying, there's just very, very little of that in our culture. Now, we were the beneficiaries of that. I know when I started on the program, I had very little experience um, as an actor. 
coming into Little House. So I'd done one CBS movie of the week and I'd done a, a small guest shot on uh, Streets of San Francisco before, you know, before doing this. And I was amazed the next morning, stepping out into the world, the number of people who suddenly had a sense that they knew who I was. The day before, nothing. <laughs> The day after, it was totally different, and uh, it, it was mind blowing. I want to stop for a second because that's I want to piggyback on that because that is something that's really people. Are, so for younger viewers watching this, I mean anybody who's a, of a certain age and older knows what he's talking about. But for younger viewers, who are, I have a, a wide range of people who watch the show. It was a, it was a time where like you always heard things like who shot Jr. Luke and Laura's wedding. Like, you understand these were everyone sat and watched at the same time. There was no DVR, there was no TiVo. There, I mean, for some people, even further back, there was no uh, VCR, no, you know, there, it, it was, you had to be present in front of the television at that time. I remember when, when Roots came out, we, had, we all sat and watched it every night it came out. I mean, like Little House, Waltons, all those shows, we watched them when they were on. Like that was, you just, you, you stopped everything, you watched them. They went back to your, whatever you were doing after that or go to bed or whatever it was you did. It wasn't that you get to watch it five days later or six days later. Or, you know, it, it was in right. those numbers, 30, 30 million, 100 million, 70 million. They were saying Friends and Nines was getting like 38 million a week at one point. I guess it's like it's those numbers, you're right. They sound, they're huge and they're, they're not the whole population, but they were big enough for yeah. cultural significance. Yes. And for money, advertisers, all that stuff. Yes. You're right. So Little House on the Prairie, that show was big. I mean, yes, it, it was big. Like, it was big. So when you came on, you were on the last four seasons, five seasons? Right. For, uh, the last, from season six to the end. So I guess four full seasons and then the abbreviated three yeah. movies at the end that Michael got to wrap it up. Yes. Um, you, came yeah. in, you came into a popular show. You came in, you know, yeah. Lonzo Wilder was his name, of course. But he came into a popular show. But yeah. I'm sitting here like, oh, we know this guy. We all watched him last night. That must, that must have been a trip, though. They go to the, like, say the supermarket, going to the store. I went to a, I remember going to, James, I remember going to uh, an amusement park, you know, up in the Bay Area. I went to Six Flags, Flags. down, you know, down on the peninsula with some, That's... with some friends. And I just was overwhelmed by the amount of energy that was coming at me being in this place with a lot of, you know, it was kids and young families and the the looks, the comments, you just sort of felt like, you just felt like you were, uh, you know, on display. Mm. And it was, it was, it was very unsettling initially. I think, you know, you sort of get, you get used to it. And so it isn't as, and it, look, and no one, no one misbehaved. It wasn't this threatening right. thing. It wasn't, you know, no one was doing anything stupid, but you're just aware that you're being observed in a way that you weren't being observed before because you're just one of millions of people out there in the world. And yes, okay, you, you people, we acknowledge each other, but when it goes to that next level, it can, it can be a little unsettling until you get accustomed to it. And, you, and then you realize, of course, this is what, this program is why this is happening. This is the power of television and you know nothing, nothing touches people's lives like television. I mean, you're, you're coming into people, uh, network television. You're coming into their home, their living room, their bedroom, their kitchen, their dining room, what, wherever it is that they're watching television, you are coming into their personal space and you become part of their life experience for those moments that they're watching yeah. you. And that's a powerful connection that you now, make with people. Now, wait a minute. So now also you have an extra thing to add to this is that you're in period costume on the show. Right. So now when you're out and about, you're not obviously wearing the big hat. You're wearing right. whatever, back then, whatever the, the fashion was. So that right. must also added to the people looking at it going, they probably go, I know him, but like, and it must've been looking like, yeah, how about that? It, no, exactly. I mean, I, I think there's there's a level, there are levels of recognition, and I used to be very clear about it. But <laughs> you know, it 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 started. Did I? It starts with something as innocuous as did we grow up together? Did we? They look at you and say, you know, did we? Did we go to school together? 
do, you know, do you know my kid? Uh, <laughs> you know, and and then it it elevates to you're on. I saw you on. You're on television, and then you're on Little House on the Prairie. You are Almanzo Wilder. To finally, you're Dean Butler. I watch you on Little House on the Prairie. Yeah. Obviously, it's that last one that you're really if you're looking for that that's what you're looking for but it it is amazing that the to your you know you it's because you're coming into someone's home you suddenly become and they see you completely out of context out in the world there is no hat there's no buckboard Not, there's, yes. no, there's no dog-eared boots there's none of that yes. which makes the connection all the more powerful in a sense because your face is popping past all of the aesthetic that you're surrounded by on the program. So it's you're, and because television is this close up medium, it's less so now, but when we were doing television, television was a four, three box. You didn't see a lot of wide shots. It was establishing shot to an over the shoulder to a single lots of faces and eyes mouths noses this is this is what television was it was very different than going to a feature film where you could see a whole you know see a three-quarter shot of the person on the screen and there was somebody else and they're walking along and it's very powerful because they're 20 feet high on the screen but in someone's 12 inch television or 14 inch or 21 inch television screen they're just seeing this so you're you know you're you're your face becomes the rest of your body you know no one really knows what that is but sure. that face becomes all important and that's, that's what people point. connect to that's a really good point you look, look at the older tv shows folks you'll see it's mostly face it's mostly neck yeah. Uh, it oh yeah totally face. totally our TVs yeah are small. our tvs are small they're very small so yes i do remember well that. and the aspect ratio of the screen until it became a 16 9 screen where you could get some negative space like you know in this in this like i can move and you can see behind me, there's my, there's a company and Into the Woods poster on the wall behind me. Yes. You can see it way back there. Okay, right there. Um, uh, but in, you know, in that world that we were in, it was just like that. And you see it when you look at the old shows on DVD where they put the black bars on either side. So, yes. so they're not blowing it up. You're seeing that four three image. We yeah. can go talk to let's not take no, let's not yeah, talk we'll go to the weeds because I can talk about all kinds. Of, I, I love this kind of stuff. I can talk about that. But, but, yeah, we'll yeah. that. but, but it's just to make the point that that's where people and I, I do soaps, people see you all the time. They feel that soaps are really a close up medium. They are. That is a really yeah. close up medium. Very much. And and yeah. five days a week. So they're yeah. really in your home. So I know yeah. for me, I do a lot of uh, interviews, I do a lot of opinion shows. I get the, uh, I'll be at Starbucks and trying, you know, first thing in the morning, trying to get my coffee or whatever. Oh my God, James, can I talk to you about General Hospital? I'm like, uh, my hair's still asleep. I'm trying to get my coffee. I just, I just, I just, I just, and so I get the ones who want to talk to me. They want, they want to literally, cause they, because yeah. we presented that to them is that we're like your friends on television. We're talking about our show, yeah. we're really talking. Yeah. They want to do that in real life. So for you, what are some of the things that <laughs> probably happened for you um, from some of the fans in person? You know, I, I think now the experience is very respectful. And I think, you know, in Los Angeles, people don't really say anything to you. You know, I think it's just, it's That's it's true. considered sort of uncool in, in Southern California to um, speak up to people. It's just, you know, because we're all sort of in the game, right? That's everyone's, so you, you just don't, but I know when I'm out on the street and I see somebody I that I know, that I've what I I take notice and you sort of you know you but I don't I don't approach people um so I don't get approached I haven't gotten approached a ton in Los Angeles through the years I mean there is acknowledgement no question about it you know in the years going back all those years ago I just think it was this wonderful enthusiasm that was coming at you and of course the questions that you always get and I think anybody who you talk to from Little House will always tell you that the first question is, you know, what's it like to work with Michael Landon? That's the, that's the big question. And then 
you know, and then it would go to, in my case, what's it like to work with Melissa Gilbert, who at that time in her life was America's sweetheart. Oh, yeah. You know? oh. So um, those were the those were the dominant things. And then, you know, do you really know how to ride a horse? Can you really drive a buckboard? Can you, mm. you, you know, it's all of that kind of thing. It's amazing to me the number of people who looked at it, James, and thought it was real. Oh, wow. You know, I mean, it's like, it's, it's an interesting separation of reality. They I mean, people talk to you like you really do live in Walnut Grove and you really know all those people and you live your life there with those people. And and it's not a television show at all. I think, you know, William Shatner just had a, you know, he, he over the years just had a field oh, yeah. day with this, with the oh, Star yeah. Trek thing. And I, we all remember that, you know, the Saturday Night Live sketch, you yes. people get a life. It's just, it's yes. a television show. Yes. I think what we always have, James, with Little House is the sense of the spirit of it, the, the sweetness of it, the warmth of it. Yes. That, you know, that, the emotional life of Little House is what's so real for people. And, and I think idyllically, you'd want all those people to live in that place. And so that you could maybe stumble into the drive into that town or walk into that town and you see all those people that you watch on television, uh, you know, on a Monday night or after school or whenever it is you're watching the program. But I, th and I think what you, what people love about it is the emotional energy that, is yeah. connected to it you know that it, it's the sweet stories it's the beautiful music it's yeah. the you know the the beautiful photography i mean in its time you know there's a lot of really beautifully shot stuff on television yeah. now or that's made for streaming oh, services oh, and yeah, so oh, forth yeah. I mean, really beautifully produced stuff at the time little house was was if not the most beautifully produced, visually beautiful show on television, it had to be, and I, I don't know what would have competed yeah, with it. I yeah, can't think of what would have competed with it. The show was just absolutely gorgeous to watch. And, and when it was restored back in 2014 for its 40th anniversary, it got even more beautiful because the color correction technology has improved oh, so yeah. much and the screens are so much better now and the dynamic range of screens. When you watch the show now, whether you're watching it on Hallmark or on Cozy or wherever you're watching it or on DVD or Blu-ray, yeah. it, it's spectacular yeah. to look at, you know, and, and it is in fact more beautiful now than it was when it was new. So, it, you know, it has, it has translated wonderfully through time. Yeah. I, I haven't really, I've, I've really like walked away from what do people say to me? I mean, I, I've sort of like transitioned out of your question. I, but... love, I love it though. This is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. And actually, you know, and Dean, you, know, you look good, Dean. I think so. You look good. I was oh, like, well, James, you look good too, man. Hey, we're, we're trying to work it out, aren't we? We're trying to work it out. <laughs> I, you know, I, I had a hip replacement last year. Okay. So, and with the pandemic, I had to stay, I, there was oh, no yeah. place to swim where I, I was really enjoying the swimming that I was doing. It's, you know, I'm walking now more than anything else. I got up this morning and walked seven and a half miles before coming to the office to do this. You know, so I was out for just under two hours walking this morning in West Los Angeles. So walking around, I walked from our house in Westwood up through UCLA around Pauley Pavilion, uh, you know, up gaily veteran along sunset boulevard yeah, for several it. miles and back down yeah so i mean i it's a it's a nice walk it's a good way to start the day i try and get out around you know before 7 a.m so yeah, at it's this time of year you want to right be, now, yeah. Dude, it's yeah yeah now where are you where are you right now so i'm in inglewood so i'm on the west side oh. of inglewood so i'm down by lax oh my god yeah you know yeah you know it's warm, it's warm. It, although it's a lot less warm in Inglewood and in West in Westwood than it is in Sherman Oaks. Yes, I used to work out there. Yes, I know when I, my studio, my studios were there. We were in Sherman Oaks and Canoga Park and Van Nuys and North Hollywood and so see, all I, the hot I, places. Woo! I don't miss the Valley, folks. I don't. Yeah, I know. Here. No, and now I'm in the Valley right now. I have an office in Studio City I that I come to. Um, you know, 
but it's fortunately it's air conditioned, so I, I, I'm lucky. comfortable. Yeah, well, I wanna, actually want to transition to that real quick because uh, you have legacy documentaries, which I love. Documentaries, I'm a huge documentary person. That's my favorite form of of all kind of movies. I love documentaries. I love learning about people. It's probably why I'm in this business. I'm nosy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm very nosy. I just want to know what people are doing. Um, but you did some documentaries related to went to uh, Ray to Little House on the Prairie. So. Talk about that a little bit. I'm just gonna be quick because you were on the show for a certain time, but now right. you also right. have documentaries right. about Loring Goes Wilder. You've interviewed people. Right. So, like, what was that like? You know, it was my way of giving something back to the to the franchise, James. Uh, you know, it had meant and continues to mean a great deal to me to have been involved in this, and so uh, the the whole documentary thing came to came to me as an after watching the Ken Burns Civil War oh, yeah. documentary on PBS, where it just transformed what documentary could be for millions and millions of people. And uh, Ken Burns really changed the game totally in, in documentary. Totally and it was very inspiring to hear that kind of beautiful music and narration and the spectacular images and all of that. And I, my, Step grandfather, and I say step grandfather because my my grandfather had passed back in the early late sixties, okay. and my grandmother ended up, you know, some years later, uh, coming together with the man that she'd been engaged to sixty years earlier at what? the University of California, who had been married twice since himself, and they 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 met again and got married again in seven, in seven days. It's like, you know, what do they have to wait for? I guess, in right. 80s I guess at that right. point. Yeah. And he had a very interesting life story and, and wanted to tell it. And I said, if you'll underwrite this, I, I, you know, having just come off watching Ken Burns, I said, I think I can do. And I knew some, you know, I knew something about the technology, but really I just was willing to step in. And so we created this hour long thing about his life called Absolute Integrity, and which was sort of something that was very important to him. And uh, it won a, you know, it won a telly award. We submitted it just to, for tellies and it won a telly award. And then I, sent it out to people producers that i had met to get an opportunity to produce segments for telethons and you know and that kind of thing and i said i really like this i i like the opportunity of creating something from a blank page you know when i when i start something i open up my computer open a word doc there's nothing on the page and you know you sort of write you know fade up to yeah. something yes and then all the months later sometimes a year later but a long time after that fade up that first comment that first idea hits your screen there is something that you've brought into existence with the you know with a group of people that you've chosen to work with camera people audio people graphics people obviously all the people you talk to the pictures you acquire, the footage you acquire. And it's really this wonderful process of creating, you know, from all these disparate parts, you're sort of carving the statue, you know, you're, and it's, it's more like a jig, a 3D jigsaw yes, or a 2D jigsaw that. puzzle. You're putting these pieces together and coming out with something at the end. The little house opportunity, when, when I learned that uh, a company called Imavision, which had the domestic rights to little house for DVD uh, was going to do something. And they asked, you know, they said, well, could we interview you for something? And I said, well, could I make the packages? And um, so I think they, they were receptive to that because you know, they knew that I would be able to get to people and I understood it, so on. So, so that first time around, I think we did like six hours of stuff for a collection in, back in 2006 or seven. And then, um, and then in 2008, I made a, a project called uh, Almanza Wilder Life Before Laura, which yeah. was which was a piece about uh, 
based on Farmer Boy. So Laura's Laura Ingalls Wilder's second book, Farmer Boy, about nine year old Almanzo. And we shot it in Malone, New York, at, at the place Almanzo grew up. And, and it was just so much fun. And I loved putting this together. And then the next year, um, I worked with Friendly Family Productions and we created Little House on the Prairie, The Legacy of Laura Ingalls Wilder, which was really a journey into her writing experience. So, and it was a very circular view. And I did this actually with someone that comes to heart people will know. I did it with Robin Bernheim, who was one of the executive producers of Comes to Heart yes. at one point. And uh, Robin is a wonderful writer and executive producer. And so we did this together. And, and I think it's a very top line survey of Laura's writing journey. But you know, if you don't know about it, and obviously the people who are the, the real bonnet head aficionados, they, they're way ahead of you. They know yeah. everything. But for a, there's a whole group of millions and millions of people out there who don't know the details of this. So this was a wonderful opportunity. And it had nothing to do with the series, although right. everything that Laura wrote inspired the series. Right. But um, it was a wonderful opportunity to sort of get under, under the hood of the television series to sort of figure or explore the roots of it all. Um, and then in 2014, I was able to narrate a, a piece that was done by a wonderful producer called Gary Leva called The Little House Phenomenon, uh, which was done for the 40th anniversary. And I narrated that and was interviewed for that and loved it. And, and now, yeah, I'm working on after, then I did, ten, after that, uh, most recently I've done 10 years at NBC Sports producing a talk show called yeah. Faherty at, at NBC's Golf Channel and produced for the Olympics during that time. And um, and now, you know, when the pandemic ended Faraday and now I'm exploring new projects. So okay. it, it's all about the blank piece of paper and the project okay. that results like at that. the end. And, and that's really the joy of it. I like that. Um, so I was introduced to, as we were speaking of When Calls the Heart, I was introduced to it because a friend of mine said, I know you like Little House on the Prairie. So they kind of went, they went that direction. They said, it's a period piece like that. Yeah. I'm also a Waltons fan, which is another period yes. piece. So yeah. it's kind of like, so James, I know you grew up on those two. You love them. So it's funny there. And of course, Michael Landon Jr. is on When Calls the Heart. Michael Landon Sr. is on. So I'm going to ask you a Michael Landon question. Sure. Hopefully it'll be different than what you've been asked before. Okay. Yes. While you were there for the four seasons, there was a spinoff too. Wasn't there a spinoff? Kind of. It's interesting. No one's ever referred to it as a spinoff, but it, but Nick obviously Derrick, Michael no. retitled it yeah. Little House a New Beginning yes. in the in the ninth season. That's what I thought, yeah. Uh, yeah, because he st he stepped out. Right. It's interesting. I think for all of us who were a part of it, it just was it just was a step forward. I think they okay. wanted to rebrand it. I wish they just left it as Little House on the Prairie because um, you know what what we did was really about Laura's last book. Right. You know, I mean, it, it should have stayed, well, it's easy for me to say I, now, I know, I know, 40 but, years but, later. But I know what you mean, but I know what you mean, I know what you mean. Yeah, so anyway, so yes, yeah, so, so I'm sorry, did you even ask your question? Uh, yeah, but, uh, but, but that's a good point. It, it, I call it a spin off, but yeah, it was kind of a continuation. Of yeah, oh, definitely a continuation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then also the movies, but I just want to find out from you, for technical stuff, did you learn anything from Michael Landon? Because he was also writer, producer, oh director. So I mean, like, well, I mean, anything you learned from him on those direct, in those areas? I mean, where does it, you know, wh where does it begin? You know, watching. He Michael did so. Landon. He did so much. I mean, technically, behind the scenes, folks, he did so much. So now that you're doing, you're you're doing directing and producing, and I'm just curious what kind, what sort of things you got out of that from him. You know, I I think Michael just had this. Um, I mean, to, to, I don't think I would ever be able to encapsulate in this forum everything that Michael did so brilliantly, you know, but I think it's, <clears throat> it's easy to underestimate what Michael actually did. You know, 
he wore, and I put it in the context of hats, you know, yeah. he wore the biggest hats on any television series. He was the star, he was the head writer, he was the lead director, and he was the executive producer. Michael had all the control and all the responsibility. And now, and for, I, it, for, before you go further to that, can you explain to people and just briefly kind of how that was rare back then? Yeah. I think there are certainly there were people who, you know, there are people who did like, oh God, who am I, who would jump out at me? Well, like Mary Tyler Moore show. Like, they're, 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 sure. They're, okay. Mary Tyler Moore show. But, but Mary Tyler Moore starred in the show. I don't even think she was an executive producer of the show. I, what, I, I was, was her and Grant Tinker, I guess it was there, it was their company. Grant Tinker, who she was married to, was the executive producer that's of the true. show. That's true. Um, I, I'm thinking more of someone like Alan Alda with MASH. There you go. There who, you go. There you go. who did, I believe, did write some. Um, with yeah, with yeah. Uh, Alan Burns was one of the lead producers of that. Um, I think I think Alan Alda wrote some and certainly directed some, yeah, yeah. but he was not the executive producer of the show. He was not running it in the in True. that in that sense. I'm trying to think. Oh God, what is the what is the man's name who does the who does all of the you know Big Mama? Um, he does the feature films. Oh, Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry. He writes, directs, and produces everything. Tyler Perry yes. is a force of nature. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Tyler Perry is the real deal. He does everything. You know, if people have a sense of what he does, that's what Michael did. Okay. And, yeah. you know, he, <clears throat> Tyler Perry controls every aspect of what he does um, and is capable of projecting himself into every aspect of it. Michael controlled every aspect of what he did and was capable of projecting himself beautifully onto the screen as the centerpiece element in the storytelling. I, I think that, you know, Michael worked uh, seemingly, you know, I don't know when he slept. Mm -hmm. I really, I really don't know when he slept. Um, <clears throat> the fact that he passed at 54 years old, and we acknowledge the 30th anniversary of Michael's passing on July 1st of this year. Yeah. Um, the fact that he passed at 54 years old, having done everything that he had done, tells you that he burned a very hot candle. And he burned it at both ends, and it was going all the time. And he had something to say yep. and he could sit down and write a script from page one. He didn't do outlines. He didn't do breakdowns. He didn't do it. He just sort of, he, he was, I'm told now I never was in the writer's yeah. room with Michael, but I know from people, friends of mine who were in the writer's room with Michael, that he could just start with the seed of an idea and he would just spin it out and maybe some notes were taken, but he'd start writing at page one and he could write a script in a couple of days. And, you know, this is a, this is a process that takes, you know, that I takes know. writers. I mean, look, people can write things very quickly. Right, right. There's, when you have to, you can write it. Oh, well, yeah. People write it really fast, but Michael wrote everything really fast. And he was, he was capable of doing that. And he wrote on yellow legal pads. You'd see him, between shots at lunchtime in the morning before we started, he'd be sitting in his director's chair. He'd have a yellow legal pad and a pencil in his hand. And he's just right. He wrote everything longhand. Michael never used a computer. He would send the, the legal pads would go back to the office at the end of the day. And his secretary, Evie Maloof would type them up. And, uh, and we shot white pages, you know, it's like, Michael, Michael's scripts were printed up. They were sent to the network that had to approve them, but I, I don't think there was ever much question that they were going to approve Michael's scripts. Maybe there was a, you know, a pink page in there occasionally, and during the, during the shooting of a show, you might get an occasional revision. But we shot white pages, which in a world where everything is heavily revised, I know when I, I can't write my name without five revisions. You know, I, I when I'm writing something, 
Uh, it's not uncommon. When I was producing the talk show, it would be not uncommon for me to have 25 or 30 oh. versions of that script yeah. with as that as that conversation right. is being refined. Right. Now that Michael could sit down and trust his gift and just write it down. And then when he's finished, right in the middle of a scene, we're ready, Mike, he could stand up, step in. He knew his dialogue. He knew everybody's dialogue. He could step in after having set up the shot right. with the director of photography right. Right. and rehearsed the actors. Then he could step in and give a wonderful performance, cut, print, move on to the next setup and go back to the yellow legal pad at lunch, he'd go to the screening room and watch dailies of the work the day before. And at the end of the day, he'd go to the editing room to sit with the editor for a few minutes who's crafting the, the episode that they're working on now. I mean, it just, it's sort of, it's mind boggling what he did. Yeah. And, and, the, and the really outstanding way in which he did it. Uh, you know, as uh, one person who I interviewed for a piece said about Michael, and you know, it's so true, it was so obvious when, he, when I heard him say it. <clears throat> Michael knew what he was trying to do better than anybody else around him. Yeah. It, he, Michael knew what the show was about. Right. <clears throat> and this person made the point, said in a lot of shows that are done, nobody knows what the show's right. really about. Right. Uh, Michael absolutely knew what the show was about, and it was his vision that audiences have been loving for 47 years yeah. now. I mean, there were a lot of people involved in helping to bring that vision to life, but it was Michael's heart. It was Michael's soul. It was Michael's sense of lessons and, and morality and all of that. And it was surprising that he had all this because Michael was sort of, you know, Michael presented himself as like this really cool yes. Hollywood star. Right. You know, with it, with it. I mean, he wasn't a bookish guy. He was probably probably yeah. read everything, but yeah. but you know, he was a guy who walked out with a silk shirt with the oh, shirt yeah. oh, unbuttoned yeah. halfway yeah. down, and oh, yeah. the hair and the jeans sprayed yeah. on with oh, the gun yeah. and the snakeskin <laughs> boots and <laughs> and uh, you know, and the Carrera glasses and the cigarette and his teeth and cracking jokes. Oh, yeah. I don't know where he had time for all this. Was, and I think this again, it comes back to that fifty-four years. He did everything packed it in yeah he yeah. packed it all in right. and you know it who knows what michael would be doing now if he had not you know if he had not been impacted by cancer. i think he's still be doing television i, I think, think, think he would be with hallmark i think he'd be with hallmark channel i think he would be. yeah i i don't know that the networks would have continued to buy what michael exactly. was doing but now in the world that we're in now with streaming and netflix oh, yeah. and all that oh yeah Michael would have been able to sell shows. Oh, yeah. There's no question Michael Maybe. would have been able to sell shows. There's also yeah. Pure Flix. There's all, kind of, there's all kind of stations. All of it. I mean, that he would yeah. easily fit in. He'd easily He'd fit find, in. He would find a way to serve an audience. He knew that he wasn't everybody's cup of tea. Right. But he also knew that the people who loved him really loved him, and they would find him. And he was very, very confident in that. There was never, there was never a question that Michael didn't know uh, that that what he was doing was extremely popular with a group of people. He he could trust his instinct because the numbers were telling him that people were digging it. Yeah. Um, also, I'm going to flip gears to another show. It's a very cult show. One of my favorites, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yeah. You played her dad in a few episodes. I mean, so first of all, I I remember I, mean, I remember you on, of course, but. How did you get associated? I mean, you've done other television shows. You've done a lot of episodic stuff. But it's like, how did you get associated with Joss Whedon's work? You know, another person who was in control and that whole thing. You know, Joss Whedon smaller, is another uh, and back brilliant. Then, folks, it was a smaller network. It was one. It was a. It was a netlet, as they called them back then. It wasn't even one of the main uh, four. So, how did yeah. you get involved with that? Just it was just an audition. Okay. Um, it was one of those auditions that you go into the room. It's weird, you know, a, an old uh, a, an acquaintance of mine, Anson Williams, who was, oh, yes. you know, was Potsy on Happy yeah. Days. I know him. Anson was in the room when I was, now, you know, this is a weird thing. I'll just- I love it. Tell it, tell you. it, tell it. So, you know, actors, you sort of know how present you are when you can focus on who's in the room. 
Oh, okay. You know, yep. when I went in to read for Buffy, the room was not in focus at all. Oh, I, I, I didn't know who was in the room. I, I think it was a very, this was a, not a great time for me. And I went in and it was a little out of focus and didn't know quite what it was, but I'd known Anson, he was in the room and I finished reading and I, hopefully, I guess I didn't read badly, but he said, oh. you know, I, 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 he came, he, he approached me afterwards and he said, you know, I was in the room when you read and, and I just said, I know this guy, just give it to him. <laughs> I like that. And, oh, and, um, and they did. And look, uh, Hank, Hank, Hank Summers didn't appear all that. All, I think, I think Hank made five appearances, yeah, I so but too. I got a Buffy trading card. Hey, and, that's right, kid. You made yeah, it. That, that was pretty cool. I got the Buffy trading card. And, you know, I thought when I, I was, I think, my first appearance was, I want to say, was like the fourth or fifth episode of this thing, of the series. Yes. And this, all I can say is when I showed up to work, this crew, his crew, the Whedon crew, was so excited about oh. this show. Oh, okay. They were just like frothing at the mouth. They were so excited about it. They so believed in what they were doing. And, you know, then, you know, you meet this cast and you see the kind of work that's going on. And then watching the episode, how smart it was. Yes. yes. Beautifully shot. Yes. You know, Joss Whedon is a brilliant, brilliant guy. Yeah. He really is. You know, now, look, I think he's had some issues. Oh, yes. Um, yes, we know. He's had some issues, and and I don't know enough about those issues to comment. But just knowing it's his name's been in the news, yes. But make there can be no mistaking, and no one would question this. Joss Whedon is a brilliant oh, creative. Yeah. Oh yeah, he really is. Yeah. And and I and I'm sorry for what has occurred there. You know what did occur there? I it's sad to say had been going on for Hollywood for years and yeah. years since the first cameras rolled yeah. in hollywood yeah. that kind of stuff yeah. has gone on and uh the world is changing our world is changing and people aren't accepting that behavior anymore nope. and so when people are behaving that way there are consequences and joss whedon is facing for whatever you know it, whatever those consequences end up being he is he is facing and the list is long you know, yeah. it's a long list of people. And yeah. um, I know that's not what we're here to talk oh, no, about, but, it, but it's a, it's fascinating how the whole, I have nothing but respect for Joss Whedon as a creative presence. It, you know, he made personal mistakes with people. Okay. He made personal mistakes. Those we, we don't, if those things really happen, we don't want those things to happen. But anybody who worked with Joss Whedon would know what a talented guy. Yeah. He was. Buffy, Buffy was good. Um, really good. Yes. Now I want to switch another another thing because you mentioned the two behind you. I'm a Sondheim fan, yeah. And you've done again. You've done Into the Woods, Company, West Side Story. Anything you also right. do? Okay, so I've, I've, so okay, this is like a little, almost like a speed round. Oh God, I'm okay. I now don't ask me to sing anything. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. So see, okay, because, don't. Because, I did another show where someone said, you know, sing. Maria or something, no, and oh, I drew a total blank and felt like I hadn't sung the song in 30 years. Yeah, exactly. Don't ask no, me no, to no. sing a no, song, I'll, James. I'll my, no, I'm a performer myself. I would never do it. I never, I never do it. <laughs> I'm like, pay Dean to see it, <laughs> sing it. That's what you got to do. Pay him. Oh, to and then Dean would have to rehearse for a month before exactly. he would think about it. Hey, but it's some money, though. <laughs> I won't, I won't use you for free, Dean. I'm, I'm your buddy. Okay. I'll you for free. I'll but if you want to talk about songs, we can talk about songs. That's, that's what I mean. It's, 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 you know, can I, 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 well, James, you play piano. Here's a keyboard. I'm like, why well, don't I mean, I don't, <laughs> don't I mean, do that. You don't do that. <laughs> I, never, I never do that. But that's pretty funny you say that. But no, yeah. pay Dean Butler to sing uh, Maria. And then we'll talk. Oh, my God. Yeah. But well, you, you'd wish you'd want to take the money back. <laughs> Well, I gotta tell no, you, no, wait, wait, that's wait. a tough song, James. I know it's tough. I know it's tough. I know it's tough, tough song, tough. and very tough considering where it's placed in the show. Right. For Tony, you know, Tony does 
the biggest part of his show in the first 17 minutes of the show, you've got Tony sings four big songs in the first 17 minutes of the show. And Maria is the toughest of those songs. And it's the last one. And Tony was written, Tony was written, uh, or Tony was always cast as a baritone. Yes, okay. Uh, Tony was written for a, for a sort of a, you know, a tenor, for a sort of a low tenor. You know, you don't have to be full on tenor to sing Tony, that would be too easy. But it was always cast with a baritone because they wanted the thrill of, you know, the, a big note, the E, the E flat at the top of Maria for a baritone is a big note. Yes. And to get there, everything's got to be working. <laughs> yes. I, I, I remember, you know, when we went to Tokyo, we had rehearsed for two weeks in, in New York and then flew to Tokyo and then did double days for a week before we opened in Tokyo. So we had been, you know, I'd done the show 16 times in the week preceding the opening night. And I was completely shot when we opened it. I mean, I I really was shot. I, I remember Maria blowing apart the E flat at the top of Maria in the first two performances, because I was just so exhausted. There was no, there was no voice left. It got much better as it went on because we stepped into a normal running schedule and all the double rehearsals stopped. But boy, opening that show in Tokyo was not pretty. Uh, It was beautiful. I mean, look, all the dancing was wonderful. I mean, this was really, it was, this was, when we rehearsed this in New York, Jerome Robbins came to the came to the theater, and I'm trying to think of the theater that Chorus Line was running in at the time. Oh yeah. At the yeah. Anyway, so you know, it was running, and we did a run through for Jerome Robbins in this theater with all the Chorus Line stuff against the back wall. That you know, uh, that was nerve wracking. That was probably the most that was probably the most anxiety provoking part. And, you know, I was nowhere near ready to have Jerome Robbins critique me on any any level. Right. Exactly. You know, and, but that was really, really cool to be able to be a part of an, a production of this show. Uh, You know, this Jerome Robbins sanctioned all the a productions he had to see them all. Yeah. These were like museum pieces of where the dancing was his dancing. And that's really what he cared about more yeah. than anything yeah. else was yeah. is that the, the choreography, the blocking, all of it was done in a particular way. And um, when you saw in, in, in Japan, they did this with a 60 piece orchestra in the pit and that music with a 60 piece wow. orchestra. Amazing. I, it was just incredible. Nice. It really, it, the sound of it was incredible. My, my blowing apart the E flat aside. Yes. It was really- there were so many great performances yeah. in this show. I mean, people who had been doing this for years, I had never done eight shows a week before in my life. I didn't know what that was. I was cast because Little House was a huge hit in Japan. Uh, That's why I was cast. There you go. I mean, I met with the director. Uh, I met with the director at my agent's house in Hollywood. We chatted for a few minutes. I sang a few bars of Maria. He said, okay, you're, you, you're going to do this. I'll hire you for this. No one said at the time that it was because Little House was a huge hit, but fine. You know, it yeah. didn't matter. It, yeah. I, I was just delighted, you know, yeah. to have the opportunity. But you don't know what that is. If you haven't done that before, Yes. Doing eight shows a week, particularly with a big load, it's, I mean, for everybody, it's exhausting. But if you've got a big vo- load, particularly a big vocal load or a big dance load, the lessons that you learn about your body, about your oh. voice, about yeah. your stamina, 
learning to economize your show so that you give just the energy that you need to give and not cheating anything, right. but that you're giving, but nothing more than what's needed because you've got to do it tomorrow and twice the day after that and the day after that. And you're going to get one day off on whatever the day is that they decide that is depending on what you're doing. Uh, you're going to get one day off and you just, you've got to be very, very careful with what you're doing. You know, when I was doing Into the Woods, Bernadette Peters had been there and Bernadette Peters and I, you know, I didn't, I worked with Bernadette Peters four times during the PBS tapings of the show. Um, and the stories about Bernadette Peters, who's a lovely person, but she literally would not speak when she was working on Broadway. Oh, wow. During the day. Yeah. She she saved everything for the stage yeah. and did not, you, you couldn't engage her in a conversation. If she did, maybe she whispered, you know, okay. everything was uh, this, you know, she was whispering to you. She didn't want to connect her vocal cords. And wow, watching her perform, watching her do the witch. And into I, the I saw her, and into I, yes, she was a bomb. She was, she was really good. She was awesome. Yeah. She was awesome. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I, I, that, that, being indoctrinated into the Broadway eight show a week experience, that legit theater eight performance a week schedule uh, was something like West Side Story playing Tony was a real trial by fire for me. It, it gave me, I mean, it looked scared to death, didn't know if I was going to be able to do this, but you know, you just step in and you do it and you know that when the curtain goes it up at eight, someone's going to be on the stage right. doing the part. And there was no way I was letting my understudy get up. Oh, that's, that's because, right. You're like, that. <laughs> you're because like, my understudy was really good. You're like, uh oh, you're staying there. My understudy, Steve Blanchard, ended up playing Pa in the national tour of the Little House on the Prairie musical oh, that, Melissa, that, that Melissa Gilbert did playing Ma. Steve Blanchard played Pa. So, I knew how good Steve was. Yeah, he did. So you're like, okay. You're like, and so he's going to be really good. There was no way I was going to let him sing Maria. That's hilarious. I because it. it's like, it would just be off the charts spectacular. Yeah. And I just, my own vanity just could not let that exactly. happen. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you, each, each of the three shows, okay. Yeah. Favorite song, favorite song to sing in West Side Story for you? One hand, one heart. I love that song. Uh, <clears throat> you know, it's just it's warm and beautiful. It's not a real rangy song. No, you've had a little bit of a break. Uh, actually, it's right. It's it's after Maria. Um, or maybe isn't it? But isn't, but isn't there a, a long uh, end to? Is, is there? Is there? Don't you have to hold a note at the end or no? A low note at the end. I can't remember. If it was a low note at the end, I mean, it wasn't. I think there was a shared, there was a, you know, a duet note yeah, with Maria yeah, at yeah. the end of it. Uh, but it wasn't, it was sort of a night, you know, there was blocking involved in it. There was a story being told, the moving of the mannequin okay. there, you know, they're in the dress shop and they're, right. it, it, there's, there's, a, you're not just standing there singing the song. No. There's something else going on. And I think that was, that was really fun. Um, the, 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 uh, the big, what tonight uh the the big tonight. it's the big well tonight but tonight tonight yes but it's the whole thing where you you know you've got the jets over here and the sharks are over here and tony's there and maria's there and everybody is singing this thing that's a beautiful visual number to look at because you've got these yeah. beautiful pictures I agree. I agree. on the stage and everybody is singing their big their big number um yeah. That was wonderful to sing. Uh, obviously, once I got, a, and I won't say I ever got a handle on Maria, it was always a challenge. Yeah. Um, but at least I felt like I got to the point where I wouldn't blow it up yeah. at the big moment in the uh, in the song. I, I, you know, I just, I loved watching the dancing in the show. Yeah, it's good. You know, I could stand in the wings and watch yeah. these people. Great, great, great dancers. It's a great choreography. It's a great choreography. Oh my God. The, the, the Jerome Robbins choreography is just incredible. And it's this physical, 
you know, it's it's a very masculine form of dance. It's yeah. very physical. It's powerful, and the Sondheim score is so incredible. I agree. Just I agree. power, power, power in those moments. Uh, it's awesome, and yet it's interesting. It's never been wildly successful. It's been around. It's one of. It is considered one of the game changing musicals in the in the in the history of musical theater. But it has never. You know, it wasn't Cats. It wasn't Chorus Line. I I was ready to go to sleep after the first ten minutes of Cats. It wasn't Chorus Line. It wasn't Phantom of the Opera in terms of this right. run. It did, oh, yeah, right. It did, you know, it didn't capture people the way those shows did for whatever reason. Uh, but make no mistake, I mean, anybody who's seen it, and if you've seen it done well, it's yeah. it's a beautiful night. You're right theater. about that. So I, it's funny how, uh, again, we'll, we'll get to Toots of the Weeds. And see, I could talk about this forever, too, because I love Broadway. Um, Cats is one of those that mystifies me. Song memory is great. I like the song. But other than that, I'm like, I you know, I'm, I was a chorus line fan. I'm a family opera fan. I'm a Jesus Christ superstar fan. Sure, like sure. I get, I get though, I get why those were kind of the, the you know, big cultural hit. They're a hit. That yeah. You, right. But you're funny. West Side Story. I mean, yeah, it was a huge hit movie. The soundtrack was number one of the year back in the '60s. Like you're right. And, and we've got the Spielberg version of the movie coming out right. now. You right. just know it's going to be spectacular. Right. But you're right. It's not the same as I see. You know, I, I was, okay. I, I'll share a little theory with you about why Chorus Line, like why that one for sure was a huge. It resonated with people because everyone's in that situation, whether it's in a Chorus Line or at a job or sure. in your family. Like it's sure. very, everything, it, they just, it was just a relatable story. Right. Like, you know, of being, of, of being picked, not being picked, of your, your life, each of them telling their, each of them telling their stories, the one from right. Puerto Rico, the one over here. Right. Like it's just, it's this kind of ageism, sexism, getting your right. boobs done, you know, the whole, it's, it's so relatable. Yeah, yeah. I think that's why that one does resonate. Family yeah. Opera is also that Beauty and Beast story. It's that Beauty and the Beast story. It's that right. whole, you know, right. um, you know, zero diversion acts kind of type story. It's like, you know, he's off the side, he's sulking in the corner, you know, he sees her, you know, it's, I mean, those kind of, way, but West Side Story, but you think it's, it's universal too. It's kind of, it's, it's, West Side Story is Romeo and Juliet. Right. I mean, it's, it's, right. It, it's, it's a tried and true tested story. It, there is just for whatever reason, it didn't. It 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 has it has come back so many times. It will always come back. People will always do productions of it, but it's never had this massive run. You know, it, it's, it's not like Chicago. Chicago's another one that hit big. Another one hit big. Just great, big. great, mu great music in, right. and great dance in Chicago. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's okay. interesting. So it's a very. I never thought. I never thought before until you said that. I was like, you're right. It's like, I, yeah. You're right. Another story. We'll get to that another time. <clears throat> Thanks about that forever too. Um, I love Into the Woods. I've seen four different productions of it. Uh, I saw one. I saw the production of Brandon Peters. I think I believe you were in it. I think I saw in that one. I, I was. I was the first replacement for Rapunzel's Prince in that original Broadway okay. in okay. the original company. Okay. So yeah, Bernadette was gone by the time. Um, there was a whole host of people who played the witch during the time oh, yeah. that I was there, probably most successfully by Nancy Dussault, yes, who I'm played sure. it for the humor of it. Yes. And she was wonderfully funny and silly. And she well, was the, you know, great. for the second half of the show, you kind of need it's kind of fun. You need it. I mean, yeah. I like, yeah. I gotta see what happens the second half of the show. That part is my favorite part of the show. Well, that's what happens mean. after Happily Ever After? after. I mean, that's that's what the show's about. Right, exactly. So I want to ask you, what was your favorite song in singing that? Well, obviously, I, I only sung two versions. You know, we did Agony and the Reprise of Agony. Yeah. So for me, well, I mean, in the okay, then uh What's what's the song at the end? I mean, you, did, you, did song, you did a song with everybody else. You did, you got, it was like you did three, I think. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, it's so two and a half. Two and a half. I'm trying to think of the at the end, the whole as the, everything's being wrapped up. Yes. I mean, it's, yeah. they're just. Uh, it's got children will listen. It's got yeah. which is yes. Great children song. will listen is a beautiful great song. Beautiful melody. Yes. You know, it's everything that Sondheim writes. It's so thoughtful. I know. The lyrics are incredible. Um, he does the work for the people who sing his songs. You have to sing. Yeah. You have to sing the song 
but he's done so much of the work for you. And the songs are, the songs are not easy to sing necessarily, right? but they, they are, I mean, Stephen is, you know, an example, uh, you know, the most revered writer in his era in the American musical yes. theater. Uh, at, for the complexity, the nuance, the, you know, S Stephen hasn't had the kind of, he hasn't had Andrew Lloyd Webber commercial right. success. Right, right. But make, there's a benefit of Sondheim music being done every day of the week in New York somewhere. Because people love this work. They <laughs> love the songs. Yeah. Um, he's incredible i mean you know i remember auditioning for him i remember being coached by him wow. um you know yeah i mean that was the the into the woods experience for me was pretty great i i you know i i hadn't you know i didn't really have to audition in an in an official way for west side story because that i met privately with a director at my agent's okay. house okay. Okay. so i didn't have to walk into a room and hand the music to the right. companist and Good. blah 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 i didn't have to do any of that yeah. so i remember walking into the room this was down at the music center in los okay. angeles okay and so in the room was james lapine paul gemignani jennifer merlin the casting director and stephen sondheim the, the four sitting at the table. Now, I can tell you the room was very in focus when I came in. I'm sure it was. I'm sure that, it was. It was very in focus. And I remember coming into the room and I just, you know, I was, I don't know, I was feeling really confident that day. I felt like I was going to sing the song really well. I came in and I said, you know, guys, it's nice to meet you. I've never really done this before. I, I, I'm not sure quite what to do here. Stephen gets up from behind the table well let me show you and he comes up and he shakes my hand he takes the music and he hands it to the accompanist now you just stand right here you sing the song blah 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 i mean it, it was the others were just sort of sitting there like what the hell is happening here? i know so he comes up and he you know he does this and he goes and sits down and i sing the song and then i sing the 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 little red riding hood song too which oh, was yes. really fun yes I never got to go on to Cinderella's Prince, yeah. and, and you know, it, it, I think it would have that would have just scared the hell out of me. But I think I sang it well in the audition. They hired me two hours later. I mean, oh, it yeah. wasn't there was no callback. There was a, they just wow. they just hired me, wow. and I was on a plane two weeks later for a year in New York. Had to find a place to live. Had to you know be put into the show when you go into a show in new york you know it's a two-week process you start watching the show at night and you're working with the stage manager and the accompanist a wonderful accompanist who is legendary in the broadway community named paul ford paul ford is just absolutely brilliant he is sondheim's guy wow. and it just you know it just was an incredible experience I soaked that costume the first night I went on stage, that beautiful green velvet coat. I sweated through that. I was probably on stage for no more than 12 minutes. But still. The, 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 yeah, at the end of that, when Paul Gimignani in the pit, the guy who had sung for, looks up and, you know, puts his hand up and acknowledges you that, you know, you did this, congratulations, you're in now. Magic. Yeah. And then to, I did 320 performances of, of, of Into the Woods. Wow, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, as we start, I mean, I, I could talk to you forever, but it just, they, they don't want me to do that. But I'd love to. You just say, so great. I love all these, I love all these stories. I love all this stuff. Um, you do have this uh, prairie patchwork over in South Dakota. I've been in North Dakota. I've never been to South. I've been, in, I've been to Bismarck. I've never been to South Dakota. Yeah. Um, but beautiful country up there. Beautiful country. And I do ride horses, folks. I'm a, I'm a equestrian. I love I would love horses. I was a kid. I used to go to Hollywood Park all the time. Well, the so do you ride? Do you ride an English saddle or a Western stock saddle? Western stock saddle. Okay. That, that's what I was taught. I mean, that's what I was yeah, taught. yeah. I understand. Yeah, yeah I was taught. So I mean, I'm, I'm a totally equestrian. There's a bunch of us in Hollywood on the soaps. Me, Captain Kelly Lang, Trusty Milk, where we all love our horses. I love horses. So we said earlier, do you ride a horse? I'm like, well, I know I ride a horse. I, I, I love horseback riding. Can we get back to it again? 
uh, one day I have to own, I like to own my own horse one day, one day. I have a, a nice patch of land back here. So I'm hoping maybe one day. Oh I'll my God, man. If you're looking for a place to throw money away endlessly, know, buy a horse. I know, exactly. Oh my yeah. God. I'm, I'm just waiting to hit it really big. I'm waiting, to, I'm waiting to hit it really big where it doesn't matter. I can buy it all for his taxes or something. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, but I love horses. Give, give that a shot. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. I won't get. I won't get to that either. But we love that. But but you have this every weekend in July. You've been having these little get together. The first was called Authors. The now this weekend it's artists. Um, there's a, an art show, a food truck coming. Um, a, it's going to be a, a, a concert. Yeah, a concert. And then next weekend it's going to be the actors. So oh, you and Alice on Graham going to be there and. Right. Um, it's gonna be. I mean, so where's this guy? Fifty years in the show. Am I? Is it really fifty years old? Is it really younger than I am? What's going on? It's actually. So the show is forty in its forty seventh year. Okay. So okay. Yeah. So uh, two thousand twenty four will be the fiftieth anniversary. Okay, I feel a little better of, now. A little of the better. series. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know, and Allison and I have been to Desmet, South Dakota, any number of occasions. Allison is a huge fan favorite. I mean, the, you know, I know, Nelly, I know Nelly, yeah, I mean, Nellie Olson is an iconic television villain. Yes. In in pin curls. Oh, you know, yes. right, just, right. In, right in, yes. Yeah. And so, you know, it's always, I mean, when you're there with Allison, you just, you know, it's going to have a lot of energy. It's always going to be fun. Um, you know, so, and obviously we were supposed to go last summer. That did not happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's nice to see things getting started again. I, you know, I, I really don't know what the, you know, I haven't looked, I haven't wanted to look to see what the vaccination rate is in, uh, in South Dakota. You know, I, I don't know. I know that, you know, I've been vaccinated, fully vaccinated, been fully vaccinated since March. Um, right here. Right here. I, I hope people are getting vaccinated, you know, but I think that there's a lot of, a, a lot of uh, vaccine hesitation in that part of the country. And uh, I think it's really unfortunate. And, uh, but that said, I think it'll be, I think it's going to be a, it'll be a nice opportunity for people who want to gather to celebrate something they love. Um, and I think probably we'll be wearing masks most of the weekend, yeah. although there may be a lot of pressure to not wear masks, but I'm going to have multiple masks with me. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 you know, James, I never would have expected 42 years ago when I started this that I would still be associated with it. In the no, way. Next, question, yeah. don't next question to you, like you, I'm sure you did. You're an actor. You're an actor. You do a job. You want to the next one. Right. Exactly. Yeah. This, I think, you know, I think actors get the jobs they're supposed to get. I think this is something that this was something I was really meant to be a part of. I grew up in an environment that was very similar to this. Uh, that's a whole other story. We could end up talking about that, but I think we probably like, blown through your my god look at the amount of time we've been yeah, on I know. it's been wonderful so I, I love yeah. it's been wonderful. uh we could we could do this again if you want to but i, I think yeah. I, I think i i was i've been very fortunate with little house i was hired to do something that i was very well suited to um i've been honored by the messages that the show presents uh, i am proud to be associated with them I never imagined that I would be connected as long as I have. And, you know, Michael said one day, this will outlive all of us. And uh, at the right. time when I was 25, 26 years old, I said, yeah, right. Sure. Uh, and now at 65, I'm thinking, uh, yeah, it is going to outlive all of us. And, yeah. and really honored that it will. Yeah, definitely. Um, so dsmetpageant.org, you can find more information on that. Um, it's, it looks like it'd be a lot of fun, folks. I mean, the question yeah, if, you, if you can get yourself to Desmet, South Dakota, which is like what two hours from Minneapolis and an hour and a half from Sioux Falls, if you happen to be in the area, come, on, come, come on. on by. Hey, I'll tell you, in LA, I've driven an hour places and still yeah. play. So, I mean, you that's drive I mean, an hour to go to the grocery store. No, I, I get it. You do that, but you know. But you gotta fly hours to get to a place where you can That's drive true. hours. That's true too. But yeah, yeah, if you're, yeah. but people watch us from all over the country. If you're in those areas, yeah. go there. Try to do out. that. 
But my last question to you is, y'all yeah, love to talk to you again on our show, it'll be great. Um, who is Almanza to you? Is he a brother, a twin, a friend, or something else? Uh, Almanzo's me, you know. Almanzo's me. I, and you know, I, I think that's a really great question that you asked. I think a lot of times actors, I, I mean, I think, and when I think back on it, James, I wish I had allowed, I had been comfortable enough in my own skin to allow more of me to be right on the surface with Almanzo, because I think when that happened, when I was tapping into stuff that was really genuine and real for me, when I allowed that to happen, because of course at that time I'm thinking, well, I'm an actor, I need to be acting here, but really the, the message really need to be, you're an actor here, don't act at all. Mm. That's, you know, that's, don't be acting, just be, just be. And I think I was best when I was allowing myself to be, and I think all these years later, I know that, you know, if I were ever to do it again, in whatever form, I would allow myself to simply be more of, of who I am, because I think, you know, ultimately, that's what the audience connects with anyway. The camera doesn't, you can't hide from the, you know, the camera looks right into your soul, looks right into your eyes, it sees the truth of who you are, why dance around it? Just be who you are. And, and let and let the chips fall where they may. And if the audience likes it, they like it. And if they if they don't, they don't, and nothing right. you can do about that. Right. You know, but you never can. You cannot trick the camera. Uh, I, I, I wish that I, I wish that I had really known that back in those years, and I just couldn't have. But I think Almanzo is me. It's you. I like that. Yeah. Dean yeah. Butler, thank you for your time, and we'll do this again. We'll do this again. I'm your new friend now. I mean, we're new buddy. We're buddies now. We're new friends. Well, James, thank you so much for having me. You're a wonderful conversationalist. You're eclectic. You you have a lot of interests. Uh, good luck in all the things that you do. I mean, my God, man, you're you're you know you're like one of those hardest working men in show business yes, guys. Exactly. Yes, <laughs> I'm having fun and I'm I'm enjoying it and. I take none of it for granted. So, I mean, I just, I'm very fortunate to be able to be somewhere where I can do all this stuff. I'm yeah, very, I'm very awesome. fortunate. We're all very fortunate. We're in a place yeah, where we, we can actually express ourselves however we want to. Yeah. That's well, and fortunate. good for you and best of luck as it continues on for you. And um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I'm sure you'd have a very, uh, very receptive to, if you reached out to other members of the Full House cast, they would love to come I and want chat to, with I you. Want to, I seriously, yeah. I want to, trust yeah. me. You were the first yeah. of, the, of the group. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start reaching out to others too, trust well, me. Well, oh, oh, you're gonna have fun. Yeah, if you do that. Yes, yeah, 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 absolutely. I can't, I can't wait, I want to, I want to. One of my favorite shows as a kid, so I love it. Um, everyone, so I have Dean Butler. Oh, where can he follow you? That's a, that's a good question online. You, you know, follow? I'm I'm so not good with social media, <laughs> but my, <laughs> my, my <laughs> Twitter handle is at Dean M Butler. So Dean Moore Butler, but Dean M Butler. Um, Facebook is, I think is just, is. Dean but Facebook could also be at Call Me Manly. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. I mean, so you can see, yeah, you can search and find me, but I, I, I in all honesty, I am not a great social yeah, media. Maybe you're I'm smart. Really maybe you're the smart one about all of us. I don't know, but I'm just, I'm just not. Uh, I'm, and uh, look, it's working for you, James. Keep doing it. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of work, though. Ooh, it is a lot of work. Yeah. Yes, it is. So, everybody, thanks for watching the show. This is Extra Connections here. We're Extra Connections show on Facebook. James Lodge Jr. all over the place. Sales of media all over the place. YouTube channel, hit that subscribe button. I'm an online network with over 35 shows, ranging from Star Wars to soap operas to, to all kinds of stuff on there. So, go ahead and like, subscribe, comment, share. Be kind, rewind. Everyone, please have a great weekend and we'll talk to you soon.